Andrew here with Newegg. We're here with AMD's corporate VP and GM of desktop PCs, David McAfee, to talk everything about AMD Ryzen 7000 series processors and the new AM5 platform. We've collected questions from the community and we'll be asking David a lot of great questions about the technology, ecosystem, and the claims made thus far. David, thank you for joining us today. How's the feedback been so far for the launch of the Zen 4 platform and the Ryzen 7000 CPUs? Yeah, Adam, the, the feedback so far has been absolutely phenomenal. As we rolled out the product a couple of weeks ago, got really fantastic reaction from press as well as from the live stream that we uh, broadcast around the world. I think people are really excited with what they see. The performance uplift, the power efficiency of the product, both look absolutely fantastic. It's an incredible leap generation on generation. Uh, and so we're really excited about what we're bringing, not with not only with Zen 4, but with the next generation platform that goes around it. Right, the buzz here is the 6.5s, DDR5, 5 nanometer, AM5, and 5.5 gigahertz plus. Uh, give us a brief rundown of why those are so important. I think every one of those fives has something to do with bringing a better experience to the end user. So we'll start with the AM5 platform. That's maybe one of the biggest leaps here because it's really the first time in a number of years that AMD has introduced an all new desktop platform. And this is really a platform that's built for the future. It's built with next generation technologies like DDR5, like PCI Gen 5, which allow the user to buy a platform today and have upgradability for years to come in what they're buying so that they can move to those next generation technologies when their needs take them there and when they're ready to make those investments. The next is is the uh, the five nanometer process technology along with the next generation processor core. And unfortunately, we couldn't make that a Zen 5 processor core, which would have been really cool. But you know what five nanometer does is it brings incredible performance per watt, power efficiency to the product. That's something that we're really excited about. The lone standout, the four in the platform is that Zen 4 processor core, which brings an enormous amount of single thread performance improvement and uh, IPC or instruction per clock improvement, which is really, really important to the user experience. That's one of the big jumps as well. This is a generation where we really focused on driving not just IPC improvement generationally, but also driving much higher frequency than any step you've ever seen in a, a Zen processor transition or any generation to generation improvement in the Ryzen desktop product line. Going from you know, where we are today in the 5000 series at 4.9 gigahertz at the very top of our product stack, all the way into you know 5.5 gigahertz and beyond, all the way up to 5.7 gigahertz is just an amazing step when you think about what that does for the experience for the end user. So we really think that all of those fives as a part of the platform bring longevity, future proofing, as well as the performance that end users are going to want in their product to make this transition to the 7000 series Ryzen products. If you want a Zen 4 system, you'll need a new motherboard with an AM5 socket. Uh, right now, there's four chipsets available, uh, X670 and the X670E at the top of the line, and the uh, 650E and the 650 more geared toward budget builds. First, let's get into what we're getting with the uh, X series motherboards. So really the X6 X series boards in general, and, and it's consistent with what we've done in our past desktop infrastructures as well. Those X series boards are really designed for the enthusiast who wants the maximum expandability and the maximum capability in their board. What we've seen working with all of our ODM partners is this um, incredible overclocking headroom as a part of the platform, putting the most power phases, the most advanced designs around overclocking support for the CPU, the, the memory subsystem, just about every aspect of the product, as well as the most IO. So you think about the number of PCI slots that are in that system, the amount of back panel IO that's a part of the system as well. The X series boards are really going to max that out and give the end user an enormous amount of flexibility in terms of the configurations that they can build around that particular motherboard. The B series boards, on the other hand, they really bring two things to the table. Yes, they've still got great overclocking capabilities for CPU and memory, but they are designed for users that are buying for potentially a smaller form factor case or for systems where it's really kind of designed for the large part around a single graphics card and an NVMe card as a, as a storage device as a part of that system. So not quite as much expandability, maybe a little bit more of a constrained build if you want to think about it that way. But for many users, that's exactly what they're looking for is something that fits in a nice, small and tight case, something that gives them 
room to put a high performance graphics card and NVMe storage devices into that system and still with great overclocking headroom as a, as a part of that. The other nuance, you talked about X boards versus B boards. The other nuance in the rollout of our 600 series motherboards is extreme boards versus non-extreme boards. And that's the E at the end of the nomenclature model numbering for the different motherboards that you'll see out there in market. And that E really has to do with the amount of PCI Gen 5 support that you can find on those boards. With those E series boards, whether that's X670E or B650E, those E series boards are going to have PCI Gen 5 to a by 16 graphics slot, as well as multiple NVMe storage devices on the board. Whereas the, the non-extreme boards are really gonna carry that PCI-5 connectivity primarily to a storage device on the platform and not necessarily to those graphics card slots as well. So again, it gives the, the end user a lot of flexibility in terms of capability and price point that they might be looking for in their boards, depending on kind of what they what they see their future needs as, as they enter into this next generation platform. I wanna talk about why PCI Gen 5 support is uh, important in terms of real world benefits that users might experience. Each of these PCI transitions effectively doubles the amount of bandwidth per lane that's available between the processor and a device, a you know, connected device on the platform, whether it's storage or graphics or, or whatever it might be. We led that transition from PCI 3 to PCI 4 in our last generation platform. And so bringing PCI 5, which is really the, the newest, latest standard in PCI connectivity into our AM5 platform is something that we really wanted to introduce into the platform, mainly because when we think about the introduction of AM5, we want this to be a platform that users can buy into today and meet their needs for many years to come. And so what you'll see this holiday season is the introduction of the first PCI Gen 5 devices, which are going to be NVMe storage devices. By doubling that throughput per lane, you effectively get much higher peak read and write speed performance than you do with a Gen 4 drive. Now, that's not necessarily going to affect everything that you do. You know, a, a user might ask, boy, when I, you know, save my file, am I gonna notice that it does so faster? Not necessarily. You know, some of those things are very random transactions between the CPU and the storage device. But when you're talking about things that have large blocks of data to move. And I'm thinking of things like loading games or a creator who's working with really large models or video files or things like that. Those are the type of things where you'll notice that performance difference and that doubling of the bandwidth that PCI Gen 5 brings you. So just like we saw in that transition from PCI Gen 3 to PCI Gen 4, it's gonna be those applications that have, you know, that heavy data movement where you're going to see the biggest impact and the most benefit when it comes to, you know, working with those really large files, complex models, big games that you want to load, those types of things. I think video editors are a great example of somebody who will really see a benefit with PCI Gen 5 and give them an opportunity to do their work faster, which is, you know, really what, what we try to do is we push the boundaries of high performance computing. Indeed, time is money. Uh, what about in the video context? PCIe gives you more throughput and uh, how would we experience that in realistic terms for video or gameplay? When it comes to those types of applications, I mean, I, I think it's fair to say that if you're a video editor, many of those applications are not loading the entire video into memory. They're loading pieces of that at a time. They're doing subsampling of the video that you're working with. So you're not necessarily always going to see a dramatic difference in that experience that you get, depending on what part of the workflow in video editing, for instance, that you might be dealing with at any particular point in time. So it will be certain cases where you've got that really heavy IO back and forth between storage and the processor where you're gonna see the most impact there in a video editing application. And I think games are, are another really good example, right? A lot of games you've got, gosh, I mean, you know, think about how large the downloads are when it comes to purchasing um, one of the latest AAA games on Steam or, or other platforms. You know, you've got gigabytes and gigabytes of data to load and these huge texture files and all of these other things. So that's a massive amount of data to move back and forth from that storage device into the processor and then into the other peripherals like your graphics board in the system. And so getting the maximum bandwidth there and combining it with capabilities like smart access storage, uh, which is an AMD technology that allows you to better utilize that processor to disk interaction are going to help reduce that game load time, give you a better experience and get you from clicking start on a game to being you know, in the midst of playing that game faster. I see with the Zen 4 platform, there's backwards compatibility with PCIe Gen 4. Uh, this might be good for someone who wants to use some of their existing components in a new build 
and kind of leave the door open to upgrade later, uh, if I'm getting that right. I mean, I think that's one of the one of the great things about uh, PCI devices is honestly, whether, whether you have older legacy devices that might be PCI Gen 4 or even earlier, PCI Gen 3 or, or even older than that, plugging those into a PCI 5 slot between the processor and the device that you plug into that board, they will automatically, you know, handshake with each other and negotiate the speed and rate in, in which they can talk to each other. And so you absolutely as an end user don't have to go out on day one and buy all new PCI Gen 5 devices as a part of your platform. In fact, many of those devices don't exist today. There are not, you know, PCI 5 graphics cards in market, for instance, today. And so what we're doing here is really providing a capability for the end user to have that that future proofing that investment protection of the motherboard that they buy today and know that as their needs change as their needs grow as new devices come into the market they've got the opportunity to use that same board and upgrade components within their build and get a better experience leveraging that next generation technology so ready for it today but not a purchase you have to make on day one the ram you probably will need to purchase new however uh zen 4 uses ddr5 and is not backwards compatible uh, what is so great about the latest DDR5 standard? You know, the reality is DDR4 memory technology has been around for many years. Um, that standard stopped evolving. Gosh, I think it was at the end of 2020 is when the last standards update for DDR4 memory was introduced. And that's the same time, actually, that DDR5 was introduced. It picked off where DDR4 left off. And so it's it's got a couple of benefits that are really important to desktop buyers. What DDR5 promises to do is increase the capacity per DIMM dramatically over what's available in market today. It brings higher data rates, so more data throughput between the processor and memory, and it brings very low latency as well. So those applications that care about very large memory footprint or very low memory latency or very high memory bandwidth, those are all better solutions with DDR5 memory. And that's why we were so confident that DDR5 was the right choice for this platform because it really is a product and is a technology that is set up for the future. We're at the infancy of that technology today. And just like DDR4, it's only going to get better over time. And let me spend a minute just talking about memory selection with DDR5 versus DDR4, because there are some nuances there that buyers need to be aware of as they evaluate this new platform, as they think about the components that are going to go into their system. Really, the, the center of the ecosystem of DDR4 memory was built around a memory stick or a DIMM that had either 8 gigabytes or 16 gigabytes per DIMM. One of the big advances with DDR5 memory is you get much greater capacity or density of memory with DDR5 over DDR4. That kind of center of the ecosystem shifts from DDR4 being eight gigabyte and 16 gigabyte per DIMM to in the DDR5 space, it's more 16 gigabyte and 32 gigabyte per DIMM. As you add more DIMMs per channel to any system, the effective frequency or data rate that the processor can drive the memory drops off uh, fairly substantially. So a DDR5 5600 DIMM, for instance, that goes into a system that can run at that speed in one DIMM per channel mode, put two, t two DIMMs per channel into that same system, and that memory speed drops down to 3600. So really, you know, one of the advantages with DDR5 is I can carry the same capacity that I could build with a DDR4 system at either 32 gigabytes or 64 gigabytes of total memory in that system, but do it with only two sticks of memory, one DIMM per channel, and get the benefit of still having exactly the same memory footprint in my system, but having much higher memory bandwidth because of the higher DDR5 memory speeds, as well as having very low memory latency that we can drive in that DDR5 platform as well. So honestly, my advice to users as you think about that DDR5 platform and AM5 is Think about a one DIMM per channel configuration because you're really going to get kind of all of the benefits of the right size memory footprint for the platform, single DIMM per channel to drive the highest data rate between the processor and the memory device and the lowest latency, which are all going to help the user experience. Here's a question from one of our viewers. Uh, who are your QVL partners for four DIMM, two DPC RAM modules? 
as we're going into market, one of the key things that we introduced as a part of the AM5 platform is a standard or a, a technology that we call AMD Expo. What we've done is we've worked very closely with a number of partners like G-Skill, Guile, Kingston, Corsair to build memory kits that are truly optimized for AMD platforms out of the gate where you can put those memory sticks into the platform one click overclock to get the greatest memory performance out of that system and have a great experience right out of the box and you'll see that across those range of memory kits that say amd expo on it you'll also see that support in the bios from all of our motherboard launch partners like asus gigabyte msi and asrock uh, the two dpc default speed is 3600 megahertz with ddr5 uh, is that comparatively lower than the Alder Lakes RAM frequency? I think the optimal configuration for somebody building an AM5 platform is a one DIMM per channel config. You get that same size memory footprint, but you keep that high data rate at 5200 or 5600 or 6000, and you get kind of the best of both worlds by staying in that one DIMM per channel regime with the DDR5 and AM5 motherboard. Uh, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about something we mentioned earlier in the interview, which is the IPC uplift. I feel like IPC or instructions per clock is sort of the unsung hero whenever we talk about CPU specs and performance. Uh, can you break down how we should understand IPC and the significance of the uplift we're seeing uh, in the new Gen 4? IPC or, or instructions per clock is one of the key metrics that we, that we look at when we're designing a new product or designing a new, a new generation of our processors. It, the best way to think about it, instructions per clock is a measure of how much work a processor can get done in kind of each turn of the crank if you want to think about it that way. And so the more you can get done in every cycle, the more efficient the processor is, the faster you can complete your work, the better you perform across all applications. And so honestly, whether you're a gamer or a creator or you're looking for responsiveness out of Windows, you know, that that IPC will kind of lift all boats and give you a better experience no matter what you're doing with your PC. And it's a it's an incredibly important metric when you look at how a system operates. The other really important thing to look at is the frequency that, it, that, that the processor operates at, right? Because it's that combination between how much work you get done in one turn of the crank versus how many cranks can you fit into a given period of time, which is really, you know, that measure of processor frequency. So you multiply those two together and you're you're effectively getting a, a proxy for the single thread performance of a system, which is what, you know, many people look at when they look at evaluating different processors that they might want to purchase. That single thread performance, again, is one of those metrics that has a lot of impact, whether you're a gamer or a creator or, you know, looking for system responsiveness or trying to have responsiveness across the hundreds and hundreds of tabs that you might have open in a Chrome browser. I don't know. But it is it is a hugely important metric and something that, you know, we are really investing in in every product generation to make sure we deliver the maximum IP and the maximum frequency uplift to ensure that we're driving the best experience for the end user. For sure. Uh, AMD seems really stoked about the single core performance gains. Uh, let's talk in realistic terms about some of the tasks that benefit most from single core performance. If you take a step back, I think it doesn't matter what you do with your system. You could be somebody who's a gamer, you could be a creator, you could be an office productivity worker. Uh, you could be somebody who's doing you know 3d video editing or cat there are portions of any and all of those workloads that have a lot of dependence on the single thread performance of the processor and i think that's the best way to to look at it is it kind of doesn't matter who you are or what you do with your system there are, are certain applications or certain portions of applications even that care about single thread performance there's portions that care about multi-thread performance and so as an end user you know understanding the balance between those two is really what leads to having a great experience with your processor and getting the performance out of your system that you're really looking for. So, you know, kind of back to that question of, all right, where does single thread performance really matter? What I would say is games are a great example. A lot of games have high sensitivity to single thread performance and show significant uplift when you have greater single thread performance in a system. Moving over to the, let's call it productivity space, things like web browsing or office productivity applications, many of those have a significant amount of dependence on single thread performance. And so when you're looking at, you know, responsiveness and performance in, let's call it everyday computing type of tasks or everyday computing type of experiences, single thread performance is really important for that as well. And then take that all the way to the other end of the spectrum, right? If, if you're a video editor or you're somebody who's doing CAD or three 
3D design, even within those tasks that might have portions that are really heavily multi-thread dependent, like I've created a character, but now I want to render it. That rendering portion is, is heavily multi-thread dependent. But as you're designing that character, as you're doing 3D modeling, as you're doing some portions of the workflow of a, a video editing sequence, some of that's going to depend more on single thread performance. And that's why I go back to that balance between the two is really important. Having both great single thread performance and really strong multi-thread performance is really what any user should be looking at when they're thinking about their next process or purchase. All right, so let's talk a little bit about overclocking. Uh, one of our viewers that uh, had a question, is the curve optimizer feature for PBO available through Verizon Master? Okay, so will, will 7000 series have curve optimizer? Uh, the short answer to that is yes. That is a feature that will be available on 7000 series as well. I want to point out that, you know, over the past couple of days, we've just announced some uh, some amazing new overclocking world records that we broke when you know we started unveiling the 7000 series with some of our closest partners in the technical press the 7000 series processor overclocks incredibly well and i think end users will be really excited with what they can do on just a, an AIO water cooler, as well as, of course, there's extremes out there that use LN2 liquid nitrogen overclocking, which hopefully most of most of the viewers of this video are not doing at home. But um, just overclocking on water gives fantastic performance on 7000 series Ryzen. And I think you'll see some really incredible results. That's awesome. So AMD is showing performance gains in gaming titles like Dota 2, CSGO, Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Uh, can you speak at a high level about the role of the CPU in gameplay? Obviously, when you think gaming, your mind goes to the GPU, but the CPU plays a part working in tandem with the graphics card. Each API that's used in the development of games over the over the years has different characteristics between CPU and GPU that, that they prefer. Each of those APIs also has different characteristics around, you know, do they prefer more single thread or multi-thread capability as a part of the processor? The other piece that goes into it is what resolution do you play your games at? Are you a, are you a 1080p game player or are you a 4K game player? And that's gonna have an enormous influence on what the bottleneck is or what the throttling element is in your, in your system build as to driving the maximum frame rate and performance of the system. I mean, at the end of the day, the job of the CPU in a gaming system is to keep that GPU fed and give it information as quickly as possible so it can render the next frame and feed it again then so it can render the next frame after that. So as those frames move to higher and higher resolution, the GPU takes on more of the load and becomes more of the bottleneck of the system. Um, that's why if you look at reviews out there and, and read read things from the tech press about gaming at different resolutions, you see as the resolution goes up to 4K, that range of, of wins or losses that are driven in a, in a CPU platform from one product to the next get really compressed and, and become much narrower. As that moves down the spectrum and you're playing more 1440 or 1080p games, that CPU plays a much heavier role because you know the GPU can very quickly render those frames and it's just hungry to be fed all the time. And so the CPU becomes more of the bottleneck in some of those lower resolution gameplay scenarios. So that's not a straight answer at all that I'm giving you, but there's so many factors that go into uh, how the CPU and GPU work together to deliver gaming performance. Thanks for breaking down a semester's worth of computer science into a few minutes there. Okay, so we talked about gaming, now let's talk about uh, content creation. Uh, something that jumps out to me is the multi-threaded performance gains we're seeing here. Uh, can you speak to those and how you're able to achieve that with the new architecture? That multi-core performance for creators is something that has always been a core focus area for our Ryzen processors. Since the introduction of the first Ryzen processors, delivering more performance for creators is something that's been kind of at the heart of the product line. The elements that went into making that enormous jump in creator performance from the 5000 series to the 7000 series it revolves around a couple of things. And I'd say there's two really key elements as a part of that. One is, yes, that IPC uplift that we talked about a minute ago that's important for single core performance is equally important for multi-core performance. The other piece of it that's critically important is the five nanometer process technology that these processors are built on. That's maybe kind of one of the unsung heroes as a part of this whole story of what we've done with 7000 series, but you know, building this in five nanometer makes it the most advanced high performance desktop computing processor that exists. The power efficiency of that five nanometer technology allows you to run 
at higher frequency, even under a very heavy load. And so I think one of the things that end users will see when they get the 7000 series processors in their hand, play around with them, test them under different workloads, is how high we are able to maintain an all core or a, a heavily loaded frequency on these processors. So, you know, crazy things like our 16 core uh, Ryzen 9 7950X being able to maintain an all core frequency under many heavy all core rendering workloads that is five gigahertz or greater is just a huge step forward. And so you think about that jump in frequency or effective frequency that you can run under load because of the performance per watt power efficiency of this processor times the IPC benefit is how you get to these really massive gains in creator performance that are heavily threaded, utilize all of the cores and threads in the processor to get the work done. I think it's a, it's a really interesting technology story that kind of turns itself into a great benefit for the end users there. Another thing getting lots of buzz is uh, the pricing. We see that the 7950X coming to market at $699 suggested retail price. Uh, recall in October 2020 when the 5950X was released, it was about 100 bucks more than that. Uh, is this the effect of the supply chain writing itself or are you taking aim at the competition here? It's no secret that the, the dynamics of the supply chain and the processor industry have been really unprecedented over the past couple of years. But, you know, the way that we establish pricing for our 7000 series products has very little to do with that. We look at where we are with our products. We look at uh, where the competition is with their products. And, you know, at the end of the day, what Ryzen is all about is delivering great value to the end user. And so we chose price points for each of these products that we believe puts us in a very competitive, very compelling performance per dollar point uh, versus the competition and versus our prior generation products as well. And that's how we landed on, on the launch prices for the 7000 series Ryzen products. Okay, so now let's go through the four Ryzen 7000 CPUs that are launching and we'll pair them with a hypothetical GPU in a hypothetical build. Let's start with the 7600X. All right, so 7600X, I think in our list that's that's like the heart of the mainstream gaming platform the gaming performance um, that this product delivers even at a ryzen 5 brand level is really pretty incredible and i think that's one of the things that we showcased during the launch of the product is matching up a, a Ryzen 5 7600X against a 12900K from the competition and showing superior performance across a, a, a range of games there. I think we've got a, a really, really strong mainstream gaming product with the Ryzen 5 7600X. So that's where I would target that user. Yeah. That mainstream gaming 7600 processor, I think that's most likely to go into a B650 board, either B650 Extreme or B650, depending on whether that user is looking for future upgradability to PCI Gen 5 uh, graphics or not as a part of that. In terms of memory configuration, I think the sweet spot here is 32 gigabytes or, or two 16 gigabyte sticks of DDR5 5200 Expo memory. And then I would pair that, um, I'm an AMD guy, I'd pair that with a, an AMD Radeon RX 6750 XT with 12 gigabytes of memory. And I'd put a, a terabyte uh, M.2 SSD into that platform, either PCI Gen 4 or Gen 5, depending on the type of storage requirements you have as a user. Let's move up the line to the 7700X. All right, 7700X, this moves more into the performance gaming space for us. This Ryzen 7 space, I think, is where a lot of users will kind of split the line between some opting up for an X-series board, many remaining with that B-series board, just depending on how much expandability that they want with that system. But for a gaming user, I think a lot of those gaming users will really love the capability and, and price points of the B-series board. So I see a lot of them staying there. Uh, more so than moving up to the X class. Again, I think this is this is a user, 32 gigabytes of memory, uh, two sticks that are that are 16 gigabytes each. DDR5 5600, so going up a memory grade to get a little bit higher memory bandwidth or memory throughput as a as a part of this platform. Again, Expo memory, so you get the lowest memory latency. And here I'd put that with a, a an AMD uh, Radeon RX 6800 XT with 68 gigabytes of, of frame buffer memory and a one terabyte uh, M.2 SSD. Again, PCI 4 or 5, take your pick, depending on the needs of uh, that particular build. Let's add some more cores and threads to the mix with the 7900X. Go up to the Ryzen 9 space, you get into the Ryzen 9 7900X, you're starting to really blur together somebody who's a gamer or somebody who's a creator. I think this is a this is a space where 
You see more uh, usage of the X series boards in Ryzen 9. You see, you know, more usage of those extreme boards as well, where those users are looking for that investment protection, where they probably, you know, can envision needs down the road, where they want PCI Gen 5 storage and graphics as a part of that build, but maybe not something that they want to invest in, in in day one. Start with that X series board or even a, a B650 Extreme 7900X processor. I'd move up to 64 gigabytes of memory, so that's two DIMMs at 32 gigabytes each. DDR5 6000 Expo memory, so again, stepping up one more class in terms of the speed grade of that memory. I'd pair that with the, the best of the best, the Radeon RX 6950 XT with 16 gigs of frame buff memory. And likely this is also the user that would be considering dual storage devices, so looking at two single terabyte uh, M.2 SSDs, and that may be more likely be some PCI 5 blended into to that configuration than just straight PCI 4 that you might see on some of the more Ryzen 5 and Ryzen uh, 7 builds. Okay, let me ask you this. What can the 7950X do that the 7900X cannot do? Both have incredible capabilities. I think for the buyer who wants the best of the best, who you know leans even more in that creator direction, but still, likes to do some gaming on their system as well. That 16 core 7950X is kind of the Swiss army knife that does just about anything and does it incredibly well. And if you're a user who has an aspiration to get into more creative workloads, if you're already in creative workloads in you know the current build that you have and are looking to expand your capabilities and get into more complex software applications that potentially you know give you a need to have more cores as a part of your processor, I think that's where the 7950X comes into play. Still great for all around everything else that goes on, but when you have the, the highest demand on those really heavily threaded workloads, whether that's 3D rendering or video editing and video encoding or, uh, or even software development, those are the places where that 7950X just you know edges out the 7900X and really delivers a fantastic product. And what about the 7800X? Did you guys skip this one? For many generations, the 800X and, and 700X have coexisted. Honestly, as we're launching this series today, the 7700X is is our high power eight core processor. You know, we're not uh, not unveiling the rest of our our 7000 series AM5 product portfolio today. But you know, the the product and the platform is young, so expect more news to come as we go forward in the future. Who knows? Maybe there's a home for for something that has a 78 model number to it at, at some point in time. So is my 5950X still a really good CPU? I mean, there's a lot of excitement around the 7000 series. What about my 5950? We believe that the 5000 series will continue to have a very long life in the AMD portfolio. And as we look out to 2023 and beyond, that established AM4 ecosystem delivers some, some really incredible price performance at a system build level for an end user who wants to put either a gaming or a creator system together. And so uh, whether you're looking at a 5950X or whether you're looking at a, a Ryzen 7 or a Ryzen 5 in that 5000 series family, between all of the elements that go into building that system, you're gonna get a really incredible bang for your buck and still have a system that has an amazing amount of performance and capability to it. So that's gonna be a core part of our portfolio as we go through 2022 and 2023. And we expect that AM, AM4 platform to continue to have you know, a, a very long and, and very healthy life. I also noticed AMD moved from a PGA socket to an LGA socket for Zen 4. Uh, was this to help ham-fisted builders like myself? We began in the Ryzen portfolio first using LGAs, I guess I would say in the modern era with our Threadripper processors. Uh, but now we've brought that into the, the mainstream part of our desktop portfolio as well. So ease of use is a part of it, yes. The other part of it is as we look at these next generation IO technologies, things like DDR5 pushing speeds up to 6,000 and beyond, as we look at PCI Gen 5, the signal integrity that we can drive by using an LGA socket is, is superior to what we could do with a, a micro PGA socket that we've used in the past. And so there's many benefits, many benefits of, of moving to LGA. And I think it's a technology that will, will be with us for some time to come. I also noticed that the CPU cover is sort of a puzzle shape. Uh, why does the IHS not cover the entire chip? And what is the purpose of those little chiplets in the uncovered area? Very, very good question also. That, that is a design that has sparked much controversy 
uh, throughout the development of, of the 7000 series processors. Uh, it's also a processor that's gotten a lot of nicknames along the way, um, you know, because of that very unique shape of the, the IHS on the product. As we put the 7000 series processor together, really looking at all of the mechanical factors that have to go together, the retention frame that's a part of the socket, the chiplets that are underneath that IHS, decoupling capacitors, which is what you see on the cutouts or the notches within the IHS, that all has to fit within the, the sort of clearing or, or keep out that's a part of that, that retention frame. And so, you know, if you think about the difference between AM4 and AM5 for a second, you know, that AM4 used pins that plugged into a socket. You really didn't have a frame per se that created the force to hold it down. It was more of a, a force that, you know, pushed against the, against the pins once it was inserted to the socket. So you could have an IHS that really covered the full plate or the full face of that processor in, in prior generations. Moving into AM5 and that LGA socket, one of the things that's really important is to get that signal integrity, there's a, a frame that creates the force between the processor and all those little LGA springs uh, or, or pins sitting below it. And so because of that, it has a, a little bit smaller keep out window. And so uh, you're able to see some of those decoupling capacitors uh, through the notches in the in the IHS around the processor. And that's uh, maybe the uniqueness of the 7000 series design. That's great to know. David, thank you so much for sharing your wealth of knowledge with us today. I'm super excited to see these new chips in action.